When BL boss Michael Edwards first signed the Honda collaboration back in 1979, there had been some people thinking that was a questionable decision. And while the first fruits of that labour was the slightly uninspiring triumph for claim, it hit a high point in 1989 with the Rover R8, the 200 and what was become the 400 saloon after that. And in that same year, the styling exercises began for this, the Rover 600. Now, unlike the Rover R8, where Rover were far more involved with the uh, dynamic engineering and some of the other styling touches, Rover were really quite restricted to what they could do with this particular car. So here we are inside a Rover 600. It marks one of the um, final Rover Honda collaborations and it was definitely one where Honda had the lead. There were plans to replace the Austin Montego with a kind of development of what was going to be the Rover 800 replacement. But when it became apparent that Rover probably didn't quite have the financial resources, the reversion to a Honda tie-in was very much on the cards. But the game had moved on a bit really. Honda didn't really need Rover as much. They already had their own British plant, so Rover just had to largely inherit what would become the 1993 Honda Accord. And I guess because the Honda Accord was such a global success, in particular in key markets like North America, there were some quite strict rules that Rover had to follow. They couldn't change the double wishbone suspension all round, they couldn't change the engines, a huge chunk of the body in white was fixed. So in 1989, Gordon Sked led a design department which also comprised Richard Woolley to kind of create a roverized Honda Accord. Now, I remember meeting Richard Woolley many years later and he was quite critical really of the 600 styling and I think he's grossly underselling it. I think the Rover 600 styling is an absolute masterpiece. And all the focus was on this grille. Um, it was trying to evoke the Rover P4, Rover P5 Hence, you've got this rather distinctive sort of rib up the middle of the bonnet. And actually, I think what they've done with this, bearing in mind this is essentially a Honda Accord, they've done a really good job of invoking a much more Rover style, a bit of British elegance to it. Um, the front doors are the same as the Accord in which it's based. They've tweaked the back doors a bit here because there's no rear window bit here. It's all integrated into the uh, rear door. And the boot lid is really sort of quite uh, well grafted there with a sort of chrome trim around the number plate to uh, again give it a much more classic elegance that I think the uh, rather anonymous looking Honda Accord possesses. What Rover learned from the collaboration with Honda is to sort of get their input in early. So once those early design sketches had been made, the design team hot-footed it over to Japan and worked in parallel with the Honda engineers and tried to exert what influence they could. The interior is a nice design, it works very well. It's simplistically laid out but they've added a bit more wood and this being a GSI model it also benefits from uh, a leather interior as well. The double wishbone suspension is a classic Honda but um, the ride quality is, is superb. It loses out in the handling stakes, it's a little bit floaty but uh, if you want a sort of luxurious comfortable ride the Rover 600 is up there with the best of them. This is the four speed automatic nice slushy box it just slurs through the gear changes it's a lovely relaxing driving experience once rover had signed off the design of the car in 1990 they had about three years to get the car production ready it was to be built at what we now know as plant oxford where they make the mini and of course we affectionately know it as cowley it was initially only available as the two litre the 2.3 came a couple of months later and then rover introduced a 618 and indeed a 620 diesel model those honda engines they're absolutely glorious. This 2.3 is double overhead camshaft, 156 brake horsepower. It's plenty powerful enough. If you consider this was slated as the replacement to the Montego, you can really appreciate how Rover managed to move the, the game up market, all because they could develop this car on a shoestring budget with that Honda tie-in. As with so many British car industry tragedies though, the Rover 600's real problem was something completely out of its control. It was a victim of such ill-fated timing because it was introduced in the spring of 1993. And by then, Ford had introduced its all-conquering Mondeo, which for mainstream saloons and hatchbacks, it had just taken everything to a whole new level. Road testers of the day definitely slated the Mondeo as the class leader in terms of ride and handling, but its interior was stylish yet practical. Back in 1993, Autocar pitched the Rover 600 
against the Honda Accord, an Audi 80, Ford Mondeo and an E36 3 Series. And they diplomatically put the Rover 600 slap bang in the middle of that. Unfortunately, it lost out to the BMW and the Ford. And in that same issue, they also compared the 623 against the V6-powered Mark III Vauxhall Cavalier. And the Cavalier won that test as well. The problem was is that it just wasn't a bad car, the Rover 600. Quite far from it, it was actually a very good car but it wasn't necessarily a great car. By the end of 93, moves were already afoot for BMW to buy Rover. The deal was finally signed in January 94, less than a year after this car came out. And of course, with BMW involved, they weren't gonna to wanna to continue that Honda partnership. There were royalties paid on using the Accord design and for every Honda engine that they put in the front. So BMW set to work with what was to become the Rover 75. So the 600 was really only on sale for six years. I still really like it. I like what it does. I like its styling. I like its comfort levels. It's not trying to be a kind of fleet chasing, kind of go getting traffic like Grand Prix busting car. It's a comfortable, relaxed cruising car. They say above all, it's a Rover. Well, that's true. Above all, it was a Rover, but beneath it all, it was also a Honda. Personally, I think it's Rover and Honda collaboration at its best. It's a shame. I really like the Rover 600. It deserved to do a lot better than it ultimately did.